Yeah, thanks again, Phil. I mean, a topic that we could um, spend much more time on, given the, the depth of many areas that, that Phil covered. But um, as I mentioned, Philip will be staying with us briefly for lunch if there's any particular burning questions that you have. Um, but what we might do now is move on um, in terms of our next presentation, which we'll continue to provide, um, talking through um, markets, engagement with markets, um, different business models, um, and really trying to give you a bit of a framework for thinking through those types of aspects in the various case studies that we're looking at later today. So we'll leave you with Tim. So, hi everyone. Um, I've been at Bluebox for uh, since September last year, but I'm really happy to talk to you about markets today. Um, it's probably one of the most interesting parts of looking at um, what you've got in terms of your innovations, because it's certainly the connection between your innovation and some sort of consumer. Um, what I mean by markets, it doesn't necessarily mean value uh, in terms of the cash or dollar amount. It can simply mean how large the number of people you can touch with your innovation might be. So just think about it that way um, as well. So we're going to talk about, as Brent said, we're going to talk about three things. I'm going to talk about doing market research. I'm going to talk really briefly about industry engagement and the flavours of in industry engagement in, in a university environment. And then the last thing I'm going to talk about is just how to possibly flesh out your um, business model and a way that you you'd sort of think about it. Okay, so in terms of market research, I'm going to sort of address these six questions and I'm going to use a case study that's partly hypothetical and partly a product that's actually available on the market now. So why is market research so important? As part of the Blue Box technology triage process, market analysis forms one of these things that we really think about quite deeply. And this is how big the market is, where the market might be, what competitive advantage you, your innovation or the product that might come out of your innovation might have over the existing competitors in the market. And then as a result of doing this analysis, you might be able to understand better who are the partners and customers and collaborators you might need to um, convert your product, your innovation into some kind of product. So anyway, it forms part, an important part of the triage process. So where do you get all this market information? There's lots of places you can get it. Um, obviously, Google is probably the first place that you'd start. You, you, know, you type in your market sector that you're interested in, um, market report, hey presto, you might actually find a two or $3,000 market report that you can then um, look at. So, and that leads to the next point there, there's market reports. These are prepared by companies such as BCC Research. Um, what they do is they, they aggregate lots of information and prepare a, a market summary about lots of different things. This, um, different companies do different kinds of market sectors. There's a bunch of companies out there. You can get information on markets from conferences, patents, publications, press releases, basically anything you can find on the web, you can suck out information about the markets and it's really cool. Um, okay. So there's two kinds of market information. There's primary market information. What that means is talking to customers firsthand, um, you know, doing interviews with consumers about products and your innovative product and whether it's going to work and, and that sort of thing. Or there's this secondary information, um, which is using data that already exists. Um, these are generally uh, sector specific. The, the downside of uh, that kind of information is it could be a couple of years out of date. So if you're in a sector that is so fast moving and you've got an innovation that is just so cutting edge, you may not be looking at the right information. You may actually need primary information to get a better idea of whether your market's, um, whether you're addressing the right kind of market. Um, secondary information, quick to collect as you know, fast as you can open links up on a, on a, um, on a website and provide your credit card details, you can get all sorts of secondary information. Um, and uh, yeah, it's much cheaper, potentially cheaper to collect the secondary information. So there's these two kinds of information that you can get there. So, all right, let's cast our minds to this really exciting product called Instagel. Uh, just for a second, let's hope this. Um, right All right, the 
last age is over, everyone. Imagine this, you're sitting on the beach, it's really hot, it's sweat pouring off your brow. You reach into your bag, you pull out a can, it's hot, press a button, you've got a cold drink. How awesome would that be? It'd be really cool. I think it'd be really cool. Anyway, this product actually does exist at the moment. But we're going to think about it a little bit more about this in terms of uh, case study here. Sorry the link didn't work, I'm not sure why that didn't work, but not much. Okay, let's continue on. Alright, so there's been a lot of development on this product. Six million dollars later, seven years worth of research went into this thing. Um, you know, it's ready to go to the beverage market. All we need to know is a lot more about the market. What, what's the market look like? Well, who are we going to talk to? I've got no clue. Anyway, it's really, it's a really cool innovation. We need to think about this stuff before we move forward. So, what kind of industry would we be competing in? So, I'll just give you some sort of food for thought and then we'll look at our case study here. So, probably the biggest challenge to this is with, say with a product like this thing, being you've got to be open-minded about what your market might be. You don't want to have some sort of tunnel vision where you're just focusing on one thing when the opportunity could be much bigger somewhere else. So you have to be really open-minded. The best way to do this is just to learn about the players in the, in the industry value chain. Um, learn a lot about the customer segments that you might be looking at. Um, for this particular product, maybe we're thinking about um, you know, soft drinks, but maybe there's other kind of beverages that we can think about. Maybe ones we haven't even thought about yet, or maybe even other uses for this particular product that we haven't really considered. So what you want to do here is kind of develop an industry and stakeholder map. So where you start is you start looking at, obviously the secondary source sources are going to be the most, the easiest kind of information to come by. Um, so you start there, find a, a list of all of the companies that you might think are in, in industry and then you start talking to people in the industry and this is this industry engagement thing. Um, maybe people um, link you up with other contacts so your network expands out a lot bigger. So you're starting to talk to more people within different industries and obviously what you want to do is just develop this, this network of people that you've spoken to, you're asking a lot of open-ended questions and hopefully you'll get a better idea of what kind of a marketplace you've got. So let's talk about industry engagement just for a second. Uh, so there's lots of flavors of industry engagement and this, this actually maps pretty well to one of the slides that Brent had before um, with the three columns and the middle column was basically this industry engagement. Within a university environment, you're talking to, talking to industry partners uh, for lots of reasons, whether it be through uh, professional development, student training and placement, that sort of thing, advising um, companies on where they go with their corporate strategy or some sort of gov governance, any kind of research and development collaboration, whether it be you know, contract research, sponsored research, some sort of ARC linkage, NHNRC development grant, some sort of industry body, um, a grant with an industry body, CRCs, some sort of strategic co-investment for a big piece of equipment at a university, or even kind of what we do, innovation and knowledge transfer. There's lots of different touch points that you can have with the industry, and you need to harness those in the best way you can. You have to remember that if you're if you're um, in a set, if you're doing research in a particular sector, those connections with the industry could be absolutely vital in turning your innovation into some sort of licensing deal or commercialization of your product product or potential product um, to the wider world. So you've got to think about ways to harness that. And I have to say, industry engagement at QT is a really big focus at the moment, trying to convert this, um, certainly trying to increase this category three funding for, um, site, for research at the university. So really important. That's all I want to say about it. Happy to talk to you more about that later on if you want. Okay, let's go back to Institute for a second then. What industry are we, what inter industry are we talking about here? Just give me, throw, throw me some ideas. Beverage. Yeah, beverage. What sort of beverages do you think? Soft drinks, alcoholic, 
beverages? Sports. Sports drinks, cool. Yeah, that's really good. So those kind of things. What about, um, so in, in those sort of industries, who are the big players there? Oh, we've obviously spoken about Coca-Cola already, Coca-Cola Amazon in Australia. Um, you know, there's PepsiCo, um, I think even Starbucks do cold drinks. There's all sorts of industry players. What about the, made, the beer or the alcoholic beverage sector? Line. Yep, yep, Line, any of those massive big brewing, I think there's four, SAB, Miller, uh, any of those guys. Um, okay, so great, that's fantastic. So what you want to do there is work out who to talk to in those organisations. That is sometimes the hardest thing to do, trying to work out the appropriate person to talk to. Often you go through an entry point and you get bounced around within a company for a little while before you actually find the right person that can understand your technology or your innovation and somehow think about a way that they can apply it within their company that will give you <coughs> them some huge benefit. So it's really important with this industry engagement thing is to try and find out who is the right person to talk to. So, yep, develop an industry and stake on that. So we've sort of started doing that. All right, so who's going to pay money for it? for the product. So the biggest trap you can fall into is thinking that you've got a better mousetrap than someone else. There are about, are, there's about a few thousand patents just on mousetraps. And it's pretty hard to believe that the most dominant form of the mousetrap that you can buy at a store is based on a, on a, on a patent or a, a, an idea that was um, patented in 1899, the, the cheap, dirty, wooden block with a spring attached to it, that's from the, you know, basically the turn of last century. So thinking that you've got a better mousetrap is probably not a good product. So you've got to think a little bit more innovatively. You've got to think, what does my product have that's better than any, anything else? So back to, back to a mousetrap situation, what, what what could be something that would make a, a new mousetrap a lot better? Maybe it disposes itself, it's sort of like a Roomba mousetrap or something like that. I don't, I don't know what I was thinking. Um, so anyway, you've got to think of, is there, a, is there a problem out there? So the, I have to say the problem solution is probably problem solution way of thinking about things is the most compelling way you can get people engaged with the concept. Hey, there's this huge problem. I've got a solution for you. That, that's the best way to approach it. Um, who's going to pay for it? You, you want to look at, um, oh, by doing that, that immediately identifies, thinking about it that way, it media, immediately identifies that there is a customer in mind. You've already thought about there's a problem, but the next question is, who is that problem affecting? And how's my solution going to solve that problem? So you, ideally, what you want to do is primary market research there. Get, get a test product um, made and try and do interviews with your, your, um, your potential customers and focus on things that relate to the use of the innovation of the product and see if, they, see if they like it, get an idea whether people are actually going to buy it or not. Um, yep, so who suffers, uh, ask me who suffers the problem. Um, there's something else you need to consider is maybe the person that's going to use it is not the person that's actually going to buy it. Maybe it could be, for instance, you have a really expensive medical device. The person that buys the actual product from the company might be some sort of institutional purchaser, but the real end user might be a bunch of patients. So you need to think about it that way. I guess that's sort of thinking through the the sort of value chain there. So understanding the target market industry map, and again, coming back to who you talk to, who is the best person to talk to to understand this? Is it the customer or is it the person, is it the end user or is it gonna be the person that's actually gonna buy it? So just think about those kind of things. So what you do is you set, if you're doing primary uh, research, prepare a set of guiding questions, you know, start really broad, narrow it down, and you wanna, explore a bunch of themes uh, which are sort of listed there um, 
trying to understand if your solution is going to be awesome for them or not. And the best thing you can do is just listen. Listen to the consumer or the customer or the, the person that's going to be buying your product. See what they want. Okay, so he, this is a, a pretty uh, strange example here, a bird diaper. I mean, I can't think of anyone who'd want to buy a product like this, but it's a patent, obviously a granted patent. So, um, you know, someone thought to spend a few, a lot of thousands of dollars on, on protecting something that probably has no market. So you've got to think about whether you've actually got a market or not. So let's, let's go back to the Institute. Uh, product, who's going to buy it? Who, who's going to buy it? Other than we've already uh, identified the consumers, but it, let's think about it a little differently. Um, are there any any other big? Maybe there's some institutional people that may buy it. Um, I can see vending machines taking this up because it means they no longer have to put um, the product in the machines that are refrigerated. Absolutely. So um, they can either turn off the refrigeration to their existing vending machines, yeah. or they can create cheaper vending machines that don't require external power. Fantastic! I love that. That's great. That's exactly what I was looking for. Something along those lines. Or maybe, uh, maybe you're talking about doing a deal with, um, you know, Department of Defense in the U.S. A really big institutional buyer. They want this technology so their, you know, soldiers or whatever in in remote locations can have access to some. You know, a nice, cool, tasty beverage just for you know morale purposes, that sort of thing. Those, those kind of things. Anyway, just some food for thought. Uh, we'll keep moving through this. That's great. So, do we have a winning product? Um, you know, what you really want to know is, will your product be so competitive that it's just going to capture sales over everything else that's on the market? Sometimes it's really hard to tell. So what you want to do is you you want to really identify the clear benefits and understand where you're going to be competing most effectively. And whatever, try and understand what might hinder the adoption of the, the new idea. Um, so obviously you do that by um, testing the product in side by side with competitor products and really um, understanding you know what the what the customer was really looking for, trying to understand the clear benefits and whether they stand out in the product, that sort of thing. Um, so compare and contrast. Um, understanding who in an organization might get a benefit. Um, so that's that might um, come back to say, um, say you've got say a software package or something like that. Um, maybe through being being more streamlined about doing some business process, it actually saves an organisation a lot of money from a, a corporate governance perspective, something like that. I don't know, just thinking off the top of my head. So even though the end user is someone, the company as a whole might benefit, but it may be in a different location, just through this um, being more strategic and, and um, more streamlined in, in, in uh, organising a company. So, and that might, that might have impacts on other people within, say, an organisation. Maybe they don't need five governance people for this software idea when they could do it all with one. So, obviously, there's someone who's going to lose a job there. So, um, is that going to be a problem? Maybe, maybe not. Um, so, back to Institute. Do we actually have a winning product? I mean, what do you guys think? Yeah? I think you could certainly spin it into a pretty cool, marketable product. So the example I showed you there is um, by a company called West Coast Chill, and they're actually an energy drink company that was specifically set up by the, um, the company that invent or the guy that invented the, this particular uh, way of um, rapidly cooling, uh, self having a self chilling beverage. Um, so that's an interesting spin on it. So they set up an energy drink specifically for it. Maybe an energy drink's not the best way to go. I don't know. I don't know. They certainly road, road tested it out on the market by um, setting up this energy drink at uh, music festivals around the States and then, you know, road testing their product and then um, getting the, getting uh, 
customers or, or users to tell them what they thought about the product so they can get a, a bit more market research on their products and probably develop it more. I mean, who knows, maybe the beverage tastes really awful. I don't know, that'd be my danger. I probably think you'd want to go with something that is more established. So, anyway. So how do you price your product? Um, obviously, you have to give a lot of thought to this. Uh, you can't just drop your product onto the market and then assume that it's going to sell. If it's, you know, maybe it's too expensive or too too cheap. Um, that, uh, there's an example in South Africa of a breakfast cereal that was sold really cheaply. It was really aimed at um, getting uh, poorer people to buy some nutritious breakfast cereal, but the uh, pricing was too cheap and it didn't sell. So they rebranded it, uh, put the same product in, in a more expensive package and it sold a lot better. So it just goes to show you, you got to, it's almost a dynamic curve um, in terms of pricing, you've got to kind of get that right. So if it's too expensive or too cheap, it may not sell. So, um, so there's, you know, you, you've got to understand lots of factors here. You have to understand the, what the competitors, are, competitors, competitors are doing and what the market's going to actually accept. You know, what's too, obviously you want to make as much profit as you can, but then the downside of that is it might push it into the too expensive category and then no one will buy it. So uh, this, you know, obviously secondary research uh, comes into the, the, the fore here where you, um, you're looking at what other people are doing, who are the competitors, what they, what they have on their you know, pricing strategies. So there's lots of things that contribute to this um, pricing. Obviously cost of the manufacturer of the goods is really, really critical and probably sets, sets the bar at, at a, you know, the minimum break even point. There's all sorts of other things that factor into it, like uh, you know what discounts and promotions you give. Maybe you give a, a percentage of your product away for free just to promotion, per, just for promotion purposes. You have to offset with the products uh, the profits of the products that you're actually selling. So you got to think about that. Uh, maybe there's some kind of preferred distribution channels where you can get a really cut price rate of getting your product out there. Um, you know, all these things are really important to think about. Um, you know, the, the um, market channels are really critical here. So you've got to, you've got to factor that in. So in terms of the institute, what, what do you guys think should be the price of a product? Should it be the same price? So say you, you're buying a, uh, a really nice beer where you, or you know, a really cheap beer. Say a really cheap beer, okay? And you press, how much should you pay for a can of beer or a soft drink that has you know, this technology incorporated into it, should it be more expensive, a lot more expensive? What, I guess, what, what, do you, what do you guys think? It depends in a way, because, I mean, these days, if I have to drink, a, if I have to think of stopping by and get a drink, yeah. paying more for the packaging, but yeah. I'm going to drink that in 10 minutes, yeah. it's like, I just buy it normal, I just got the right. bar at the bar yeah. or whatever, so what's the point of, of pricing it yeah. higher? Yeah. So I guess it depends on the situation more than anything. Yeah. Like if we are in the middle of camping the air truck or whatever, yeah. and we want a fizzy drink, you would pay whatever for that. Exactly. Not in the middle of the city. So I guess you probably immediately identified that your market is really stratified mm. in some way. You might be thinking that it's all the beer market, but maybe it certainly isn't. There's going to be certain consumers where this particular product resonates really well with. Um, so, the, the, from a marketing perspective, it'd be trying to work out how to build that so that you get more market adoption. So, yeah, that's a really good thought. So, in terms of yeah, like you said, in a remote location where there's hardly any alternatives other than drinking warm a warm beverage, maybe people will pay anything for it. So maybe that's that's where you should. I don't know, any other thoughts there? Um, you could price it as slightly but not significantly more expensive than other alternative beverages, but alternate, um, alternate your package presentations. Mm -hmm. So have it, say, you know, in a slab of, say, you know, if, like in a cube of 30, 30 Coke cans, and say, you know, market it as uh, this is a travel pack. Gotcha. So you have it at home, it sits in the cupboard, and when you're going out, say for example, going out to work or you're going for a trip, 
then that would be the ones you're taking the advertising as an alternative to stop and get a drink. Yeah, so sure. You have a, like, say, a beverage on demand system. Yeah. Where you're always, you know, you're always going to have a cold drink when you want it. Yeah. Provided you buy the more expensive cold drink packs in this drink. Yeah, I kind of like that idea. You have a sort of a travel, travel pack concept. Oh, it's good. All right, so you, you get the gist of it there. I mean, just, you know, there's probably no wrong answer. The only way you'd really know it's wrong is if you tested it out and it didn't work. So I guess the best thing is to do, best thing to do is to pretty much ask the customer or the consumer what they really want. So being a good listener is really important here. So how would you estimate the demand for your product? And we sort of touched on this already. You know, we'd be thinking that you know, if you were targeting the entire beverage industry, maybe that's wrong. So we've got a little market sector here. So um, this, this sort of stratified market concept. So what you want to do is you want to try and you know get into a market and then build it and grow it. Um, so you need to understand what kind of what your market scope is going to be, what how it's going to be adopted how the market can grow, uh, what things in the market um, will be kind of game changes in the market in terms of you uh, making a product bigger or you're going to lose out on sales if some you know, other, other product comes onto the market. So you sort of have to understand the market dynamics here. So what, uh, how you understand this is through lots of methods. Um, so Ideally, what you want to do is try and understand the total number of uh, target customers that you've got. Really understand this, this total addressable market. That's probably what you want to really focus on. Um, and obviously working from the bottom up by really understanding the consumer. Um, and this sort of market growth, market share, market value, that, that's something that would come out of um, market reports perhaps or some sort of um, real vibe in the market, or if it's a consumer product, sort of consumer confidence, that sort of thing, to really understand whether your products, product sales are going to grow. Um, so this, I guess there's two kind of, kinds of products we, we talk about here. One that's about an incremental improvement on an existing product, and one that's a complete game changer. Um, so an incremental improvement would be, so I mean, thinking about um, mobile phones, say the next version of your iPhone, something like that. Whereas a game changer would have been when the iPhone was actually released when everyone had those sort of flippy phones or the you know, pretty simple non-smartphone things. That, that's kind of what I'm thinking about there. So for an inter incremental improvement product, um, that's kind of a lot easier. Uh, there's lots of sales data preceding to really understand what's going on there. You know, there's analyst reports you can buy. There's lots of information out there that you can tap into to really understand how, how you're gonna grow your market. Um, for a new to the world product or a real, you know, really disruptive kind of technology, that's so much more difficult. Um, you know, it really comes down to adoption rates of the, the product. Um, how hard it is for people to really understand how they're going to get the best benefit out of the, the idea. Um, with these, often early sales of the products are kind of rare. Um, you know, you're almost having to give stuff away so you can get it into the hands of enough early adopters um, just so that they can, um, you know, through word of mouth, spread this idea that it's a fantastic product. So those kind of things you, you'd want to sort of factor in there. So yeah, in terms of uh, those kind of things, really understanding that is um, you know, really important. So how, how do you think you'd estimate the demand for your product um, for this institute thing? Um, anyone? Anyone want to throw something out there? Yeah, I mean, we've sort of captured it there. It's, it sounds like it's not really... What's the game changer aspect about it? Um, it's going to change maybe the supply chain, perhaps, and the cold, cold chain of beverage industry, perhaps. Uh, but yeah, uh, it would be easy to work out. Okay, so this, uh, this additional resources section, what I've done is I've put a bunch of old slides into two slides in the form of a table, and this is just a resource for you guys. 
What I want to convince you of is we ask questions, but really what this is doing is feeding into the seven dimensions of a market analysis you, you'd want to do um, to really understand the market. So I've, I've talked about market size, and we've talked quickly about growth rates, and um, a little, we've touched a little bit on you know, profitability in terms of um, you know, what price you should set your, your thing at. Um, industry cost structure is also really important to understand. Where, um, at what points do, do people make profit um, in in the, you know the, from the manufacturer to the where warehouser to the retailer sort of thing where, and how much profit at each point's being made you sort of have to understand that just so that you can understand maybe you can take out one of these layers to give you more profit something like that just you got to get a good idea of that uh, distribution channels that's really important to understand as well just so that you have a great understanding of of how your product is actually going to get from manufacturer to consumer if it, if it is a consumer goods um, thing. Really important to know. Uh, market trends. Um, this is really, I sort of touched on this a little bit before, um, you know, what things are going to change your market? Um, maybe people are not drinking beverages, those kind of beverages anymore because they're scared of you know, osteoporosis from you know, fizzy drinks or you know, whatever, or too much sugar in drinks or um, you know, phenylalanine in drinks is, uh, you know, causes cancer or something like that, those kind of scare things, you know, negative things. But then there could be positive things like um, people are drinking more drinks you know, because the you know people are drinking more sports drinks. I don't know those kind of things. You really have to understand, and what can really change the market quite quickly. And then there's these key success factors, which are really things that could potentially be really left left field. You know, what what's a fundamental ingredient to the success of the product? Um, and I'll put some examples there. Um, you know, some sort of maybe there's some economy of scale that you need to actually get to before you're actually making a product or driving your product to enough consumers. Um, and this obviously access to distribution channels. We talked about distribution channels. Understanding how your product gets from uh, manufacturer to consumer is really super important. So if if you've got a product that relies on that heavily. Man, I think you're going to be cruising those wheels to get that working as well as possible just so that you can sell your product. Okay, so let's move on. We're going to talk about um, business models, business modeling really quickly. Uh, and I've probably only got a few minutes. Okay, so there's only a couple of slides here. So, um, all right, so what kind of businesses do you think you can get out of? Um, doing research or doing anything at the QT. So you can, I, I, and this is not a complete list, these are the things I could think of really quickly. Maybe in terms of the, turning your research or your, your innovation into some sort of business activity, there could be these kind of businesses that I, I can think of. Maybe you, there's some sort of um, service business that you can use your innovation inside, combined with a little bit of knowledge and expertise and hey presto, you've, you've got yourself a, a business opportunity up and running. Or maybe you've got a startup company and all you're doing is developing a product towards a milestone. Say for instance, you're developing a drug and you're doing some clinical trials and then the next milestone, which really adds value, is getting past, getting a, a really successful phase one clinical trial completed so that you can move on to phase two clinical trials. Maybe that's all you're doing. Uh, or, for instance, you're actually going to make a product, um, whether it be a software or software kind of product or a device, um, and this could include some sort of lease type uh, business, something like that. So they're the, they're the sort of three main themes that I could think of straight off the top of my head. So in terms of um, developing a, a business model for this, these business ideas, there's a couple of couple of concepts that really resonate pretty strongly with us at the moment. This concept of frugal innovation, and that's sort of sits pretty well with the lean startup model from 
um, Eric Reese. Um, so frugal innovation is about um, having constrained resources, and what that what what I mean by that is, say say for instance, um, you want to develop a product as cheaply as possible, just because you don't have enough money to develop it any other way. What you want to do is reduce the complexity and the cost of goods and the cost of production in a way such that you can create a, 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 a minimum viable product. So look down to the lean startup thing there. This minimum viable product is really a critical point there. Getting a product out into the marketplace that you can actually test out. So you can get in the hands of consumers and see, get some feedback on the product. Um, so. Uh, with the Lean Startup model down the bottom there, they're, they're the real principles there. Being really lean and mean so that you can pivot in a way that if you get market feedback that tells your company to go in a different direction, you can actually do that really quite successfully and, and easily. And there's lots of examples of companies out there um, that have done that. I think Groupon's one that started as a completely different business but pivoted into what it is at the moment. Okay, so the idea is getting this minimal viable product out into the marketplace, measuring whether it works, getting some data, learning, and then kind of evolving the cycle there. So to do this, and let's see if this video actually works this time. Oh, it doesn't look good. Oh, okay. An organization's business model can be described with nine basic building blocks. Your customer segments, your value proposition for each segment, the channels to reach customers, customer relationships you establish, the revenue streams you generate, the key resources and key activities you require to create value, the key partners, and the cost structure of the business model. But it's not sufficient to just enumerate the nine building blocks. What you really want to do is to map them out on a pre-structured canvas. This is what we call the business model canvas, the tool that helps you map, discuss, design, and invent new business models. Let's briefly go through the nine building blocks, starting with the customer segments. These are all the people or organizations for which you're creating value. This includes simple users and paying customers. For each segment, you have a specific value proposition. These are the bundles of products and services that create value for your customers. Channels describe through which touch points you're interacting with customers and delivering value. The customer relationships outline the type of relationship you're establishing with your customers. The revenue streams make clear how and through which pricing so your business model is capturing value. Then you need to describe the infrastructure to create, deliver, and capture value. The key resources show which assets are indispensable in your business model. The key activities show which things you really need to be able to perform well. The key partners show who can help you leverage your business model, since you won't earn all key resources yourself, nor you perform all key activities. And once you understand your business model's infrastructure, you'll also have an idea of its cost structure. So with the business model canvas, you can map out your entire business model in one image. This works for startup entrepreneurs just as well as for the most senior executives. Okay, so um, the point of me showing that was, I think that's a really good, um, good way of just mapping out quickly your your new business idea if you've got a company or um, company idea or e even a license opportunity, I think you can really map out things pretty well using that kind of model as well. Sorry, the end of the presentation here. Um, so anyway, there's those nine, nine um, key building blocks that you, you would focus on. And this, like I said, this is just one way of, of really mapping out your new business idea. So what I want to convince you of is the stuff that we talked about before fits into this um, model pretty well. So we've, we've actually talked about the customer segments then, um, using, with the points that I talked about, the questions that I talked about before. Uh, we talked about developing your value, value proposition sort of indirectly through um, 
understanding, you know, do I have a winning product, that, that section. Uh, distribution channels, we sort of talked about really quickly. Customer relationships, we didn't really talk about too much, but that's something you really want to focus on pretty, pretty, pretty well. Um, revenue streams, how much do we charge? How, how many of these things can we sell? Um, key resources, that would be the key success factors. You know, do you actually need this distribution channel to work properly? Key activities, that would be, you know, what the business is actually doing. Um, are you manufacturing or are you getting someone else to manufacture the thing for you um, through some license arrangement? Um, what key partnerships do you need to make it all work? And then, you know, what cost structure would you have? How much should I charge? So they're the dimensions that um, that uh, fall, uh, form part of this uh, nine building blocks of this um, business model canvas, and you'd obviously flesh them out to develop your business model. Um, all right, that's so. There's there's some resources there. Um, this business model generation canvas. There's a website. Um, go to that if you want more information about it. Um, lean startups. More there. There's a great presentation from a guy called Alexander Osterwalder who um, developed this um, <coughs> business model generation canvas. Really good presentation on how to use it. Um, he's developed a, an app that basically does that, can do that for you with a, you know, inputting a few details. Um, and this uh, Lean Launchpad, there's a course you can do online. Um, lots of modules that can teach you how to build a startup. Free of charge. Free, yeah, it's pretty awesome. So some awesome resources there about startups and businesses. I mean, and, you know, there's lots of principles you can apply just to even license opportunities in that. Does anyone have any questions? Because I think that's that's actually it from Ben. So I think we made it, Brent, in a very timely kind of manner. Very well. <laughs>